which we've been doing this week. How many of y'all are from VSU 1101? Very happy to have worked it out. I think some of y'all are getting extra credit for coming. To work it out and to be able to make it a part of that because we want to reach as many people as possible. Part of the reason why um, I'm a student. Uh, before I was a faculty member, I was a student here. I came as a freshman in 1979. My sister did. My mother got a master's degree from here. My father took classes from here. Two husbands graduated. <laughs> okay? So we can have our own alumni association. And if you put us all together, what we knew about the history of the college could be summed up by that chimney piece out there that says GSWC on it. And so many people come through the doors and leave without knowing any more about where this college came from and what it used to be and what, and that affects what it is now. And we'd like to change that. That's why we're doing this, and I really appreciate all of y'all coming. Um, I'll get started now. I'll take a minute to consider. First of all, let's start with Valdosta, Georgia, in 1906. Valdosta, Georgia was a prosperous town. They were the Sea Island capital of the well, Sea Island capital of the world, which is a special kind of cotton, very long fibers, very much in the band. And if you drive south on Patterson Street, you'll see these um, large houses. Some of them look kind of Victorian. Some of them look, I don't know, Italian. -y. That's an example of the kind of money and and I won't say pretension exactly, but the way Valdosta was around the time the school was founded. And there was a lot of pride here, civic pride and enthusiasm and money. And they felt that they were tired of sending their children up to Athens and Atlanta to college all the time. They needed some South Georgia needed something. So they petitioned the legislature and the president of the Senate was from here and was behind this, Colonel West. And they finally got college founded. It was founded as a co-educational, um, agriculture, industrial, and normal college. Okay, now the agriculture, that speaks for itself. Industrial means engineering, kind of like Georgia Tech. The normal part means the teacher training. However, no appropriation. That means they had a college that existed on paper only. So they tried to raise money down here. They tried to petition the legislature. They worked at things. And over the course of six years, things kind of changed. And that's how long it took them to raise the money, get a little money from the legislature, get this site and build a building. The scope of the school changed. They dropped agriculture and industrial from the title, and they dropped co-ed. Because with the trouble they were having getting funds, they felt like it would be easier and less expensive to focus on a single sex. And there were not that many girls' colleges, and certainly none in South Georgia. Um, so it became a women's college with and it became a normal college, teacher training. And it became a two-year college. That was what finally opened. And it opened in 1913. This is the first president. He served from 1911 to 1933, so he was here before the college opened. He was very important um, in the way the college looks and looked initially. You see that he was out in New Mexico, Colorado. He stayed in a Spanish mission with um, the brothers, you know, the monks. And um, when it came time to choose what the building was going to look like, he had a lot of input and chose Spanish mission. And you see that we've kept it to this day. Um, this is the first building. Tell you about the first 
It wasn't called Commerce Hall then, and that's what it's called now. But it looks different. And we'll tell you. We'll tell you why in a little bit. But this was the first building. It was everything: dormitory, cafeteria, administration offices, classrooms, labs, everything. It was also not landscaped, so they had to put boards down to walk through the mud to get from one end to the other. This is the first year picture of the first year of the building. This is what they said officially. Every precaution is taken to make safe the health of students. The city of Valdosta enjoys an enviable reputation for health. The fall and winter climate, when the school is in session, is ideal. They don't say anything about the summer climate. The school is abundantly supplied with absolutely pure artesian water, hot and cold, the sewerage system is of the best. <laughs> Remember this was the progressive era. We just had the, um, the, the creation of the Food and Drug Administration, our, our government intervention in the meatpacking plants, healthfulness, scientific application of principles of, of health were all the rage and they were going to ensure that, that this was a healthful place. As a precaution against malaria and typhoid, all windows and sleeping rooms, dining room and kitchen are screened against mosquitoes and flies. As for the precaution against typhoid, the school produces its own milk in a perfectly sanitary dairy. <laughs> okay. Um, the dairy was not part of the school. Now, that's the what was put out for official consumption. In reality, things were a little different. When they finished the building, first of all, they weren't finished with the building when the school opened up. They hadn't done anything with the lands. This was still far, parks farmland and park swamp. So the mosquitoes, those screens were very necessary because the mosquitoes just rose and kind of surrounded everything. It took about, I don't know, a year of faculty, students, and hired help working to clear and drain and kind of get it to where it was a comfortable place to live. Okay. This is what the girls look like. This is the casual uniform. You would see this in everyday pictures. They would all wear this. They had to wear this coming to school. This is your spring uniform and your formal uniform. Keep in mind there was no air conditioning so they had to depend on their clothes to keep them cool. And while these were long sleeved, they were linen and a very light kind of muslin-y fabric. They still would have seemed hot to us today. Um, and this is the winter uniform. It's the same as that one with a suit jacket and a wool hat. Of the uniform, they said, the uniform adopted is neat, tasteful, hygienic, comfortable, and economic, economical. All students dress alike, and therefore there are no distinctions among the students on the artificial basis of clothes, and there is no temptation to large expenditures in a rivalry to outdress one another. In selecting the style and material of the uniform, consideration has been given to the climate and to the fact that people work better when they are dressed comfortably. And they were very specific. They said, here's the pattern you use for this, the pattern you use for that, and buy the clothes at Barnardos. I mean, the material at Barnardos. So, that was the uniform. Now, this school offered physics, it offered chemistry, it offered language, literature, math, you know, every, uh, academic subjects that you could expect in school. But, Part of the education of a young lady, as she was striving towards modernism and science and things like that, was also not to neglect the domestic achievements that we think of with an earlier era. So they had cooking, but they did it in laboratories that were with the finest, most modern equipment. Doesn't that look like a fire waiting to happen with all those outlets? This is 1913. That's, that's, and, and I don't know what the wiring was like, but it can't have been too, too severe. Um, this is sewing class. They practice sewing the uniforms, sewing real dainty little 
slips and petticoats and things like that. And most of the girls took classes in home economics. They also, this was not a religious college in that it wasn't affiliated with a church, but it was religious in that people were expected the girls were expected to go to their to the church of their choice every Sunday, and they had chapel every day. Okay, this was what a typical dorm room looked like. Pretty nice. And this is not this isn't how the cafeteria was. This is the uh, the dining room of the home economics building where they learned sort of fine dining and serving and decorating. They ate what they cooked in that cooking lab. Now, this is the farm. So let me finish reading you a little bit about it. I told you they had a, their own sanitary dairy, but vegetables and eggs are produced on the grounds and are always fresh. Most of the cornmeal used for bread is made from carefully selected corn grown on the grounds, and much of the canned goods used on the tables is raised and put up on the premises. Okay, now, if you took an agriculture class, and they did offer agriculture, even though they weren't an agriculture school, this is what you did. You grew food for the table. Um, they did have a farm that had a farmer in charge of it, but um, but most of the stuff produced by the, for the eating in the school was grown by the girls. Part of the school, and an important part of the school, was called the training school. That means it was what well, started out as an elementary school, later became a high school. And its purpose was to provide a good education to students in the town, but that was like a secondary purpose. Its primary purpose was to provide a place where the girls could practice their teaching skills and explore kind of pedagogical theories and see how they worked. Um, this was always really popular. When they, the first couple years they started, it was hard to get students, and especially when World War II broke out, World War I broke out, it was very hard because things were unsettled. And um, they had a lot more students in the training school the first two years. This is a pedagogical theory in action. I mean, you learn by doing. There was a lot of dressing up, a lot of pageants, making literature come alive, that sort of thing. Now, by 1916, the college had grown, okay, um, from three initially to the size you see here. This is West Hall going up in the building, uh, in the background. Do any of you guys remember the science building going up? They put the bricks first. It was this nice brick building that didn't match anything on campus, and then they put the stucco over. West Hall's built exactly the same way in 1916. And um, that's a rare photograph. That's, that's one of my favorites. Okay. Here's World War I came to SGS and C. Now, when I said the war, I meant like 1914, 1915, when the war broke out in Europe. When it came here, <coughs> already had a larger enrollment. Uh, and they were very patriotic. So they wrote the Secretary of War the day war broke out and said something like, so we are only girls. Please tell us what we can do to help. And he wrote back and said, eat less, grow more. And they did that. Um, here they are in sort of a ceremony going planting as part of the war effort. And here they are working for the Red Cross. Now, this particular, this group, um, they may have been, I think every class had their own group like this. But there may have been, so there may have been more even than this doing it. The SGSNC <coughs> girls sent more dressings than any other civic group in South Georgia that was getting together and doing this. They sent about 40,000 of them. So they were very active. And the president, Dr. Powell, took a leave of absence and went and headed up Red Cross work in Atlanta. So they did their part. This is the Literary Society. I love this. Okay. All right. 
Now, that's one literary society. There were two. That's about half the school. The other one was equally large. There's a reason for that. Here's what the bulletin says about going home, visiting friends, that sort of thing. The college is a business enterprise, and students who come here should come to attend a business. Much of the most valuable experience of a student of student life is secured during the Saturday and Sunday and Monday of each week when regular classes are suspended. At this time, student organizations, religious and secular, reach their fullest activity. On the other hand, frequent visits home and with friends tend to take the minds of the students from their work to dissipate their interest and to produce general carelessness. While the college desires to respect the wishes of parents in the matter of visits of their daughters, parents are earnestly urged to allow but little visiting. And the president even reserved the right to say no visiting in certain cases. So, when those girls came to college, they were here. They weren't allowed to go off the campus. It's much, it's more restrictive even than governor's honors in the summer. They could not date people from Valdosta. They couldn't date anybody, but they couldn't date people from Valdosta. They couldn't write letters to boys from Valdosta. They could only write letters to boys who were out of town with their parents' permission. So, here they were on this little 60 acre square of land. And they couldn't go home and they couldn't go out, and so they made the best of it. Clubs were huge. This was the literary club. They debated. They what, they, they gave speeches, they debated, they wrote, they did creative writing, they put on little plays, they had glee clubs, they had sports groups, which would be like half the school would belong to one club and half the school belonged to the other, and then they would do intramural sports. And they would do big pageants and festivals and stuff that everybody would be involved in, it would take months of work for them. We'll see that in a minute. But that's what they did, but they couldn't leave. In 1922, things were changed. Um, they declared the school four years, beginning with liberal arts focus as well as teacher training degrees. And they changed the name to Georgia State Women's College. So now they have four years that they couldn't leave the little, you know, the little 60 acre square. Actually, you could still graduate in two with an associate. Here's what the school looked like in the early 20s. West Hall was completed. I don't know if you can make it out, but these are little model T's in front of West Hall. This is the back of the campus behind West Hall. This is Congress, the first building, and Ashley. And you see that they're almost identical, and they're separated by a walkway. Now, we saw the little kids dressing up. The women of the college do their own dressing up. This is the Glee Club. It's called Love's Quandary. And they put this on in the early 20s. They built a castle for it. They made all their own costumes. Very elaborate. Have any of you attended plays here at the college at all? Yeah, they have a wonderful theater department here. Uh, they do, like, six to eight productions every year, and they're always really good. And when I was a student here, with only half the students that there are now, they, they were still really good. The roots of the theater and drama department go back to 1913, pretty much. There's always been excellence in productions here. Now, I mentioned that they put on big festivals. Uh, part of the college was, while we were being scientific and majoring in math and majoring in science, there was also elements of what I call the finishing school still in there. And one element was the old English Christmas festival that occurred every year. They started out with the um, Lord of Misrule, two heralds with trumpets, and a pool that kind of directed the ceremonies. There was always a boar's head and a yule 
fog and all these elements that they had looked up and done research about put together into this festival. Um, they had skits and dances, this is Morris dancers, pretend ice skaters, rag dolls, some Christmas things, I am a reindeer. And they always had dancing minuet in full costume. That happened every year. The rest of the stuff would change around some of it. That was Christmas festival and happened every year except for during World War II from 1913 to 1950. This is May Day. May Day lasted even longer. It lasted until 1956 and there have been a couple of attempts to revive it. And um, it always it too had these old English quote roots and they would wrap the maypole. There was always a May Queen. She was always carried on a litter or some such thing across campus and put up on her dais. And then there was um, skits, dancing, singing, plays put on for her and the court's benefit. Everybody in the school would participate in this. One year they had, um, I read, I guess in the early 20s, they had about 250 people in costume for this, doing something in a costume. Notice the balls and the giant hula hoop things. Because it was spring and it took place outside, this gradually evolved to be combined with field day, or play day as they call it. So they do all these athletic exhibitions as part of it when you got up into the 40s or so. Have any of y'all not freshmen? Have you been to Mayhem? I kind of like to think that, you know, Mayhem happens around the same time. It's developed into a tradition. It's certainly modern. It has nothing to do with this, but maybe it reflects the school's May celebrations now. And I, I like to think they're related a little bit. Um, Here's the sports. You see how they have these costumes that they play basketball and volleyball in? Sports were big. It was part of that helpful emphasis. That all girls would participate in sports unless the doctor said otherwise. And here's one of the teams from the sports clubs. They had intramural. They didn't go play Milledgeville or anything or other colleges. They just played each other. Here's what the college looks like. West Hall, Converse, Ashley, tennis courts, a little kind of um, a shack building that's a laundry and a heating plant. They use it as a gym when it's too cold to be out, too cold or wet to be outside. And what do you think this is in the back? There's a little white circle there, a little white circle there. Baseball, softball. Keep guessing. Track and field, golf. Oh. <clears throat> they had their own golf course. <laughs> and they had the stables in that direction. So um, they, they, they played some fairly elite and elaborate sports around here. Um, now, the Depression came. All through the 20s, President Powell had been going hat in hand to the legislature to get money sometimes successful, mostly not. Well, in the 30s, and things were not great. I mean, from the girls' point of view, they were great, but from the administration's point of view, they were difficult. Then in the 30s, it all blew up. If you remember what's happening in history right now, um, this year, bank foreclosures. Banks are closing all the time. There's a real money shortage. It's, it's probably the worst part of the Depression. So, faculty went without paychecks, everybody was pretty miserable. Then the chancellor came down. They kind of reorganized the whole university system in Georgia so that we had a lot less control over things. All the colleges did. And the chancellor came down and said, you know, you're a liberal arts college now, number one. Number two, um, you don't need that training school. And number three, we need you to give back 25% of your budget, so I would suggest you make it the training school. So Dr. Powell did. And because the training school was so popular, and because the 
faculty and principal of the training school had such support in the community, all kinds of stuff broke out at that point. There were petitions, there were meetings, there was mess and unhappiness. Um, so at that point, the new Board of Regents and Chancellor and this new sort of governing body that had come into being in the early 30s said, okay, we'll just take Dr. Powell and put him up in Athens in the community education and we'll send Dr. Dr. Pound from Athens down to be president of that Austin State. And then there won't be any more mess. Wrong. This is Dr. Pound, eminently um, qualified to be president of the college, except for one problem. His health was poor. He came here in the summer. By the fall, he was having um, uh, operations and halfway through his first year, we had to have an acting president. And he died in his second year. So things now, they've lost the president of 22 years, they've lost the training school and the teacher focus, and um, their president just died. Things are bleak. Hopefully the faculty get, get paid. But their dark is just before a nice change. This is Dr. Reed. Notice that he's the first um, liberal arts person. Now that we're a liberal arts college, he's a liberal arts English professor. Um, he's been at University of Georgia. He's from Virginia. And he comes from a long line of family of writers, uh, ministers, educators. And um, he has quite a colorful, he's quite a colorful character. He saved all of his short stories that he wrote and all of his rejection statements from the, the magazines like Harper's and The Atlantic that he sent them off to. We have them. Um, we even have his baby curls. Which, uh, and, and he was quite a character. But he was also well connected up in Washington. He was personal friends with the First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt's family. I don't know how they selected us. I don't know if that had anything to do with it, but the WPA, the Works Project Administration, came down here and did a lot of construction on campus. So from a time when it looked like the school was just in a hole and couldn't get out, within a couple of years, everything was being built all over campus. Here's the swimming pool. Can you imagine living in South Georgia without air conditioning for 20 years without a swimming pool? They did. So. When they got this, it was a real big deal. Um, this is Reed Hall. They built an auditorium and a recreation center in here. It's been ripped out and replaced with dorm rooms when they got those other when they got those things on their own. But this was a, a big new building. This was the centerpiece. Okay. Um, Powell Hall Library. Have any of you been into the auditorium at Powell Hall? It has big orange chairs that kind of go up. Underneath the orange chairs is this room, this sort of slightly gothic reading room that was part of there with the, with the stonework on the windows and things across the ceiling and antique looking fixtures that they put in in the 30s. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful building. Um, they didn't have to have library security, so the girls could just take, they had little chair areas set up as outside reading rooms, and the girls went out and sat and did their homework. And Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady, came down and dedicated it, and it was quite a big deal. One more thing that the WPA did while they were here was build the house in the woods. It had originally been a tenant shack that was on the property, and the girls went in and fixed it up and made it their clubhouse. Well, it was eaten by termites. So when the WPA was on campus, they said, well, we'll just do this. And it housed the newspaper and the annual, and it was where all the clubs met, and it had two fireplaces and all kinds of, you know, like a big room for, couldn't house the whole school, but you could have a good party in there in the kitchen, and that's, that became the house in the woods. 
which is actually where Langdale is now, part of Langdale. Here's some of the things that they did, the, um, the horseback riding along the trails. This is what part of campus looked like. And here is one of the fireplaces. There were two donated by the faculty, and they were for gatherings and cookouts and outdoor parties. And this is where they were now. The one that's out there isn't in the same place. They've moved it around a little bit to accommodate buildings or sidewalks or whatever, but that's what they did. At the end of the 30s, um, World War II started. Well, it started in 41 for us. Um, and we, it really changed things around here. For one thing, Christmas Fest, May Day, all that canceled for the duration. Faculty went in the military. I have pictures of the alumni and their um, wave and whack uniforms and some letters that they sent back. And every junior college, which started in the 20s for the boys, it closed and we got 13 local young men. And I kind of think part of the reason um, May Day and Christmas Fest canceled was because it was a little embarrassing to dance with each other and stuff and in front of all the guys because as soon as men come, those things go out the window. But that's that's what happened. There was also a lot more emphasis on science here, and everything sort of had to be focused to the war effort. No more swimming. We have water rescue training. Um, here's working for Red Cross. I would just love to compare this picture with the one from World War One. And um, there's not this sense of uniformity that you get, and all in their little, little white Red Cross uniforms. They just they come in and they're doing their work and um, the little headband things that they wear. Now, they were very patriotic. This is Lillian Patterson, the librarian here for many years. A little tiny lady about this high. She was the warden for air raids and stuff and she headed up the scrap drive. Now, with this scrap, we bury a Jap, District 1, Section 3. They were very patriotic, they were not politically correct, and they didn't apologize. It was wartime. Um, and, and, and everybody from the Littlest Librarian on was involved. When the war was over, it seemed like, oh, everything's just back when it was. By the way, this building here, called the Lily Building. It's where speech language pathology always was. Speech language pathology is now. It, at that time, it was a drugstore with a soda fountain, and so the girls would go over there and get something to drink. When I was a student, it was Hoagie's, which was like a bar restaurant, and then when I came back, it was Jeff's. So it's always been a place where they hang out. Everything was pretty much the same, but it wasn't really only on the outside. Dr. Reed, um, Dr. Reed's health began to fail. So Dr. Thaxton came down from the University of Georgia as an acting president and then assumed the presidency. He was a gruff, no-nonsense, his name was Ralph. He was a gruff, kind of no-nonsense, easygoing person. And he needed all that. This is the school in 1950. They called the girls together and they made an announcement. And then they lined them all up and took their picture. This is Georgia State Women's College. It's going to become Valdosta State College and we're gonna be co-ed. I think the girls look pretty happy about it, but check out some of the faculty down here. <laughs> yeah. Not good. But they came. They came. Now, when the boys came, um, keep in mind that this was the 50s, a time of, you know, we'd expanded roles and, and horizons and stuff during World War II. People went all over the world, 
And when they got home, all they wanted to do was get their old jobs back, get married, start having a family, and kind of contract. So it was a conservative time in the country. Women's roles, which had kind of stretched out during World War II, were very defined. Men's roles were very much more defined than they had been previously. So that may account for how quickly the school changed when we made it co-ed, and it really changed. Um, May Day and Christmas Fest are out the window. Uh, May Day stuck around a little longer because it has elements of this, and this came to pretty much dominate where those costume festivals had, had been, the place that had been in. Um, intramural sports, uh, they began with intercollegiate sports and the whole team thing and school spirit and big sports. Greeks, fraternities first. Okay. Here's the Rebels, the first team. The first team was a basketball team. And right after that, we got a gym, so that was like a good thing. Um, Emory Junior College didn't last but two more years after we became co-ed. Um, it had closed during the war, as you remember. So when they closed it, there was always a real good relationship between the two colleges. And when they closed it, Emory offered it to us for a dollar. And we scraped up the money and bought it. So we just instantly acquired four or five buildings for next to nothing. Here's what it looked like. And here's what the college looked like in the 1950s. We have West Hall, Ashley, Converse, Reed, Powell. The golf course isn't there anymore because the dining hall is, as of 1955, the old gym is, as of 1954, I mean, it's the new gym at this time, but now we call it the old gym. Here's us, we're a tennis court. There's the pool, and there's a small building there that they use as a bathhouse and some other things. Okay. Fraternities and sororities. Um, I like to look at, okay, if things don't change, maybe the energy gets funneled into a different direction or whatever. I see this as kind of a continuation of what they were doing with May Day, Christmas Fest, and all the dressing up festivals. It just went somewhere and did something different. Um, the Rat Day was for the whole school would go through kind of good humor hazing, I guess you'd call it. Uh, they don't do that anymore. Um, and then this is a Greek week kind of thing. Then they got baseball. The baseball team's been pretty successful. In the 60s. Okay, at this college, if you look at pictures from the early 60s, it's exactly the same as the 50s on the outside. Very conservative, very role defined. The women are being beauty queens and dating, and the men are taking science and math and preparing for careers and dating and being in fraternities. Everybody has school spirit. Um, but there were a lot of changes going on in the world around them that were affecting the school, whether they showed up in the pictures or not. Okay? Vietnam, first of all, which may have something to do with why there was so much growth during that decade, because you didn't have to go to Vietnam if you were in college. There was integration. In 1963, 19 black students applied. Two were accepted. Two were accepted because they had high grades, a lot of achievement, and they had letters from too far away. They had letters from their their churches, their teachers, their community stating that and what good students they were and that they could handle this. And it was really something to handle. 
This is Junel Thomas, Robert Lee Pierce. They started in the fall of 1963. It was pretty much uneventful. Nothing happened. And if you look in the annual, you can only find one indication that they were there, and that's in the class photos. And if you look in the newspaper, you can't find any indication that they were there. If you look in the papers of the president, you can find indication that they were there. The next year, it's just those two again. The next year, one more joined, but she dropped out. The next year, I think there were two more freshmen. So the whole four years, and when they've interviewed, they've interviewed those, those students, and they've talked, they both talked about the incredible isolation. Nobody was, nobody was ugly. They were not threatened by the Klan, or at least they have not said that they were. You know. And nobody, there weren't any incidents, but there were not any friends either. The, the school went merrily on about their own way and just left them strictly alone. And they had four solid years of they went on to get master's degrees, and they went on. He was in charge of the entire um, food assistance programs at Mass at the, in the state of Massachusetts. <coughs> she ran a house playhouse in Atlanta last time they were interviewed. Um, it was quite something. The year after they graduated, then things started to change. This is 1970. First black faculty member. First African American administrator. Eventually, and these are this is like right around the same time. This is 73, I think. Um, they started bringing in speakers and programs and all kinds of things. And it became an easier climate to be in. Um, clubs there were enough students and enough interest to begin clubs to explore, like this is um, Black Student League, and they started like Black History Week and exploring things. This is the first Black homecoming thing, Skip McDonald. She, and, and she was big in the arts and singing and put on a show. So it was, Integration here was like, okay, it was a non-event, okay? But it wasn't really a non-event. It was peaceful. But that doesn't mean that it was pleasant. Because I don't think it was for the people who were involved in it. And um, here we go. In the middle of this, Dr. Martin came. President of Emory University, Vice Chancellor of the University System of Georgia. Very, very um, well qualified, a big Methodist, strong, strong, deeply held beliefs. He was a really somebody, and he came here unfortunately <laughs> at a difficult time, I think. Um, <clears throat> He had all this fun. There were some protests on campus, not a lot, but enough. Finally, and this is in the, the same time as the, the early 70s, drug use on campus. It wasn't huge, this was not Berkeley or anything, but it was there. And uh, I've heard stories about, well, they had a lot of narcs on campus, so we all got up and we, we marched to his house and we protested and we had signs and <laughs> so I, I think he, I think there were some things that weren't too fun here. Um, this was always in the background, the Vietnam War, and we were going to have to go, or the new boyfriend was going to have to go. One of Dr. Martin's legacies here is construction. We had the biggest building boom in the 60s that there ever has been. This is an aerial photo showing where the Ed Center is, is. They're clearing for the Ed Center, and they've done some of the construction, like, like Fine Arts is under construction, the library doesn't exist yet, some of the dorms have begun to be constructed. 
They built six dormitories within about three years. Okay. Fine Arts. Nevins Hall. Um, Nevins was the administration building. It was really um, nice. The president's office was there. West Hall was not very nice in the um, 60s, late 70s. It had peeling plaster and um, streaks of mildew and water damage on the outside. It was real shabby. It was comfortable, but shabby. This one, this was the nice building. University Union came. The library stopped being a tennis court. And here's what the campus looks like. This is the biggest change that you've seen since we started showing the aerials. There's quite a lot. And there wasn't that much more construction on campus until fairly recently. Maybe three, three buildings or so in the intervening time. Okay, the Blazers came. 73. Women's Intercollegiate Athletics, finally. The alumni have been agitating for this since the 20s, and they finally started women playing um, other colleges, basketball, volleyball, softball. Okay, in 1978, Dr. Martin retired, and our current president, Dr. Hugh Bailey, who has been here longer than any president so far, including Dr. Powell, the presidency. He's from Alabama and South Carolina. This is South Carolina, but most of the time was in Alabama. Um, he presided over a lot of growth. We'll get to that in a minute. First thing happened, this happened in between while they were interviewing Dr. Bailey. Converse Hall burnt down. So it, it survived the cooking in the teens somebody left something on a hot pot and it went up because it was hard pine and dry and it just went up like, like a match. It was replaced, it was, it was, I guess it was the first building that Dr. Bailey built? Yes. Or was it the gym? The gym came later. <coughs> the first building was replacing Converse Hall. And at that time, um, there wasn't the support or the money to do a full historic preservation of the thing, a recreation of what had been here. So you cannot tell what Commerce Hall looked like by looking at the Commerce Hall that's there today. Um, that, that changed too. Early in his tenure, football came here. We'd always have basketball, basketball and, and softball, you saw, the football began. I think they're doing pretty well this year. Okay. Now, when I started in 1979, there were 4,500 students. When I came back in 1993 as a faculty member, there were over 9,000. So the school had doubled in that amount of time. The amount of buildings and stuff had not. So things were, were pretty crowded. But the school had doubled. They had started a lot of distance learning. They had started a ton of graduate programs. The school was expanding and sort of growing up, in a sense, and, and being able to meet higher level academic needs than it had a few decades earlier. One of the things that they worked for, and I don't know if you can appreciate what an achievement this was, because now everything, the legislature or the Board of Regents made everything a university a few years ago. But when we achieved university status, there were, other than like Medical College of Georgia, Georgia State, University of Georgia, there weren't very any, hardly any other universities in the system. So Georgia Southern went first, they have more they have more people. And we started working towards it. There were a lot of colleges out there that didn't want us to get it. So it was a bit of an uphill climb. And they made us and Georgia Southern regional universities. What that means is we have a special responsibility for 
the professional and educational needs of the people in our region. It means that, for instance, um, we started a college of social work, and we were starting a master's degree in library science. We started graduate programs based on people's professional needs. We're not starting a PhD program in English. For the research based, you're going to the University of Georgia. So there's a there's a delineation of what it is we're doing. Um, finally, this uh is it used to say about us state college and was given by the alumni. And this is the new one they put up and the fountain given probably by the students. It was a big dress up, and you can see um, that West Hall's been renovated in the background. By the time the late 80s came around, uh, there was a little more money, but there was also a lot more resolve. And um, the administration, the Arvelian administration, had figured out how to put their foot down about the quality of building on this campus. So when they renovated West Hall, they were able to get the money to put it back, at least on the outside, exactly as it had been before. And every other building that they built or renovated has been up to the same standards. And that's why we've won awards. The only school in the, the system we've won awards for architecture, and consistency, and things like that. But that was a big, this is, but you can see, I mean, it looks just beautiful there. Dr. Bailey, Governor Zillow. He um, sort of, they had blocked us and not given us the money to do the exploratory work to become a university, and he found it in his own budget and restored it to us. And so he was very instrumental in the growth of the college and to into a university and what we've been doing. He came down, this is the night of the changeover, and he came down to be part of the celebration. And that night there were 17,000 people there and lots of fireworks and a cake shaped like West Hall that fed everybody and it was a really big event. And um, that's where we stopped because that's what the history of the school was and now we're in the present and we're, we're writing new history kind of. I mentioned that we had 9,000 students when I came back. We grew up to 9,800. Then, now we're down to about 8,800. We're that way because for the first time in our existence, we're not doing any kind of remedial, remedial work. Our students have um, higher scores and higher grades than they have in the past, and the remedial work is going to the other, to the junior colleges. So we're still growing back from doing that. Um, so what does that mean and where are we going? And that's kind of up for, that's kind of like for y'all to decide and us to decide. Are there any questions? Y'all need to get one of these so you can show it to your teacher.